and we would go here. So the path to the double helix. <clears throat> so where do we stand with the lives of these people? So as we left off last time, Jim Watson, 23 years old, has just arrived in Cambridge. This is September of 1951. And there he's put in an office with Francis Crick. Francis Crick is working on his PhD, his third attempt to finish his PhD. And the two of them just clicked immediately. They were having very enthusiastic discussions about DNA. And Rosalind, Crickland, Rosalind Franklin in 1951 had arrived at a new position after being very happy in Paris for three years. She returned somewhat reluctantly to England and was working in King's College in London, but she had embraced this project that she had been given on doing X-ray crystallography on DNA and she was making good progress. She was obtaining good data. And we have the, the fourth member of the group here who plays a key part in this story, Maurice Wilkins. So Maurice Wilkins was the deputy head of the research institute in which Rosalind was working. He in fact had urged the institute to hire her or to take her as a three-year fellowship person <clears throat> because he wanted the expertise in DNA. Maurice Wilkins in many ways was the initiator of this whole project in that early, he was trained in physics he then worked on using optical methods of high-powered microscopy to look at chromosomes. Uh, and then he was convinced by others to look at the DNA and did some initial work on X-ray crystallography, but said, we need to get a real expert in here. And that's when they, they attracted Rosalind Franklin to come to the Institute. But he's the connector, the linchpin, because he, Wilkins, is also a good friend of Francis Crick. So he's in London, 60 miles away in Cambridge is Crick, and Crick has just gotten this new office mate, Jim Watson. And so the whole group here are all going to be working on DNA. And the interactions between them has become a famous story in molecular biology. <clears throat> okay. So in 1951, just what did we know about the nature of genes? So Mendel had shown that genes were packets of information. And following this up, it seemed pretty clear that genes had to be on chromosomes. But chromosomes were made out of protein and DNA. And people didn't know what part of the chromosome really constituted the gene. Now, an important experiment that had been done several years earlier was done by this man, sort of at the end of his career. This is Oswald Avery, and he was working at Rockefeller University. And he was interested in this question of, is it the DNA or is it the protein that make up the genes that carry the genetic information? So he did this famous experiment. <clears throat> this is Avery's experiment. He was working with a bacterium, Streptococcus pneumonia. It causes pneumonia. It came in different forms. He grew these bacteria on a Petri dish. He found that if they had a sort of rough coating on the outside, he could inject them into a mouse. And he found that they had no effect. This was a non-virulent strain. It apparently did not have the information to make a toxin to kill a mouse. However, another form of this bacteria had a coating on the outside so that they were smooth colonies. And if he used these bacteria, injected them into a mouse, the mouse would get the pneumonia and die. So this was the virulent strain. So he did several experiments comparing these two. And one of the key results was that <clears throat> he found that if, if he, <clears throat> he killed the virulent strain, <clears throat> that is he just kind of cooked these so that they were dead. They would not, would not grow on a Petri dish, <clears throat> probably broken open. 
and he put that material into the mouse, it did not cause the disease. So you, you had to have live bacteria to kill the mouse. But then he did this interesting twist on it. <clears throat> he took the type of bacteria that were not virulent and he mixed them with the dead bacteria that were virulent. And it was a test of whether some molecules in the dead virulent one could be taken up by the live one and that these molecules would pass on the genetic information for virulence. And when he did that, the experiment worked in the sense that these bacteria, non-virulent, when mixed with the molecules from a dead virulent strain, in fact, would cause the infection and the mouse would die. So what he had here then was these dead bacteria with DNA and protein in it. And the key was what happens if I add an enzyme that will degrade all the bacteria? Do the experiment, he found the mouse still died. What happens if I add an enzyme that will degrade all the DNA? He did the experiment and the mouse lived. So it was the DNA. If you destroyed the DNA in the mixture, <clears throat> you destroyed the information needed to cause the disease. <clears throat> so this experiment convinced a lot of people, not everybody, people were still pretty skeptical because, well, how do you know that you killed all of the bacteria, all the DNA? or all the bacteria, or were there contaminants in there? It was a technically somewhat messy experiment, but strongly suggested that DNA was the key. So we know at any rate, <clears throat> the genes had to be protein or DNA. And what did we know about proteins and DNA in 1951? Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me also say, I'm, I'm gonna hesitate here. Uh, I don't look, doesn't look as though this is recording. I wanna go back to my Zoom here. Oops, uh, I'm gonna come back to this. Okay. My indication it, says it's recording there. It is recording. You know, when I have it on, on full screen, it didn't show that. Okay, all right, it is. I'm gonna go back. Okay, here we are. Okay, so what did we know about proteins and DNA? <clears throat> All right, so in 1951, we knew what the basic molecules were that made these super gigantic molecules. So we knew that proteins were made of simple amino acids. So here's an, a protein, which is just a string of amino acids. If you look at this, the backbone of it goes Nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon. This just keeps repeating, nitrogen, carbon, carbon. So an amino acid has an amino group on one end and an acid group on the other end. This is acid because this oxygen can be bound to a hydrogen or it can then donate its hydrogen into the solution. That's what an acid does. It releases H plus into the solution. So this is the backbone. And we knew that proteins, typical protein has 500 of these. Big proteins can have 10,000 of these amino acids. And it's complicated because the amino acids came in 20 different varieties. So if we look here, on the middle, we got nitrogen, carbon, carbon. On the middle, we could have an attachment of a group of atoms like this, or this one has sulfur in it, or this one has a ring in it, this one has a hydroxyl group at the end. And so they vary whether they're plus charge or minus charge or uncharged. So clearly a highly complex protein, a highly complex molecule. And we didn't know how this long chain folded up. So there were, we knew just that what you had is these 500 amino acids in a row and somehow they went loop to loop around and you got this long chain and it folded up on itself. But beyond that, 
it was really not understood what the details were. And with DNA, it was somewhat the same story. So in 1951, we knew what the main components were. There was sugar and phosphates, and they alternated sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And then there were these bases, these nitrogenous bases. So every sugar had a base attached to it. Now, the DNA was simpler than protein in that, whereas protein had 20 different kinds of these side chains, DNA only had four, A, C, G, and either T or U. U is, this is RNA actually here. So let, let me show you just a little bit more of the detail of what we knew about DNA. So we knew that the building block, basic building block was a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. And they were strung together in what we called the sugar phosphate backbone. So this is deoxyribonucleic acid. That's because the deoxy part means that it's missing an oxygen in this position here. Ribonucleic acid has OH, deoxyribonucleic acid has just H, missing the oxygen. This sugar will bind to a phosphate on one side of the sugar molecule and another phosphate on the other side of the sugar molecule. And in that way, you make this long sugar phosphate chain, the backbone. And notice that the two ends are different. This end either has a phosphate on it or this would be the exposed end. The other end typically has no phosphate on it and another part of the sugar is the exposed end. So there's a definite sidedness to this. We call this the five prime end and the three prime end. But the important thing is it, it's not, you, if you flip a single chain upside down, the end of it will be chemically different. And then the final part of it is, as I said before, each sugar has attached these nitrogenous bases and the A's and G's have two rings in them and the C's and T's. So it was known that these long chains were huge. Chromosomes would have more than 10,000 of these. In fact, a chromosome could have a million of these, one exceedingly long, thin molecule. And so the channel challenge was to understand how in the world is this folded up uh, to make some kind of, of higher order structure. And, and it just wasn't known. So how would we go about doing this? There are two, two key questions. The, that people really wanted the answer to. How could DNA or protein contain information? How could they contain the hereditary information? And secondly, how could it be inherited? How could it be so faithfully replicated generation after generation, every time a cell divides? So there were two approaches to how to do this. And Watson and Crick discussed this. How, how could we solve the structure of DNA? And one idea was we could base mo build models based on the known structure of the parts. If we knew if these were stiff in some ways that they bound to each other at some precise angle, we could build a model. However, a lot of these parts could flop around and were very flexible. So that was a problem. The other really hard way to do it, but the only real good way to do it was to do X-ray crystallography. And I, I'm gonna to talk to you just a little bit about that just in just a few minutes. Now, the protein one was where the first real progress was made. And it was made by this man, Linus Pauling. He was at Caltech. Pauling was in 1951, considered probably the best chemist in the world. He was just the dominant figure. So Pauling was born in 1901. So he was 50 years old in 1951. Uh, at the age of 26, he became a professor at Caltech. He stayed there his whole life. 
a pro assistant professor in 27. He was a full professor three years later in 1930. His focus was on the electronic structure of atoms and molecules. He had training both as a physicist and a chemist. And in 1940, when he was only 39 years old, he, he started a, a famous book called The Nature of the Chemical Bond. So this is the man who understood the detailed structure of all, how all of these atoms were attached. And just by knowing what amino acids look like, and by examining how that repeating nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, how that must go together. And he predicted it would be a rather stiff, predictable structure. He was able to build a model that represented the core, a part of the structure of proteins. And this was called the alpha helix, not to be confused with the double helix in DNA. This is in protein the alpha helical structure. And I'll show you in, uh, in uh, this is a picture of showing that here's this backbone where you have carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen. And it just repeats all the way around and it forms this spiral. And it, it's stabilized by the fact that this oxygen here will bind another part of the chain above it and form a weak bond. And all of these are weak bonds that hold the whole thing together. This was really all built from simply knowing the detailed angles and stiffness of all the, the component atoms. So in 1951, sort of just, just a few months before Watson arrived in Cambridge, Pauling had published the structure, this core structure of proteins. He didn't have any good x-ray data, as I said. He built it by this rigorous analysis of, of molecule length, sizes, angles. And the people in Cambridge at the Cavendish lab were actually rather devastated when Pauling came out with this because the Cavendish lab was focused on protein structure. They really wanted to get there first. And now Pauling had beaten them. And so when Watson and Crick started talking about building a model of DNA, they were supportive. They, they kind of lost the primacy of finding the structure for protein, but maybe they could still get it for DNA. But in order to do that, they, they couldn't just use the models themselves. They needed some x-ray data. And so let's talk just a little bit about what x-ray crystallography is. Now, this is really a complicated, technically difficult procedure. And I'm going to give you a very just overview, cartoon view of it. Basically, the as I, I'd said before that the, the man who was the director of the Cavendish lab at Cambridge, <clears throat> Sir Lawrence Bragg, had been one of the inventors of X-ray crystallography. The way it worked is that if you had a molecule that you could crystallize, and it's important to know that they're not looking at a single molecule. What you do is you get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of molecules to pack together in an orderly fashion to form a crystal. And this, when this was initially done, this, this was done with things like sugar and sodium chloride and salt, simple molecules. If you then shine an X-ray through that crystal, that array of all of these ordered packed molecules, the holes in the crystal will diffract the X-rays and you put a piece of photographic film there and you'll get spots where the light comes through. You can kind of think of putting a flashlight through a piece of screen. And what you'll get is sure, you'll get light parts and shadow parts and, and it'll form a, a sort of a rectangular matrix. Well, so if you do this with a complex molecule, like here's an X-ray photo of a protein, you'll get a picture that looks like this. And for proteins, you will get thousands of spots. And this is an unusual one in that it's so orderly, but the spots will be of various intensities and the pattern will be different. 
And at this point, it becomes a very complicated mathematical problem to work back from how is this pattern of spots generated by some regular arrangement of atoms in this crystal of the molecule you're looking at. I mean, that, that's as far as I'm gonna go to say, it really depends on two things. One, you need your molecule initially to pack into an orderly array when you put thousands of them together. And secondly, you need to be able to go from this pattern of spots to a structure. And that is a very difficult procedure. In 1951, they had no computers to help them do the mathematics. And it was daunting, something that was taking literally a decade to do for the simplest proteins. Okay, so let me, I'm going to uh, get out of this for the moment. Uh, whoops, let me, uh, I'm hitting the wrong button here. Okay. All right, I, and let me just pause briefly here if there are any questions, because this, this, we're going to kind of go back to the, to the story a bit more, but I wanted to give you that, that sense of chemically what we knew, and the point being we didn't know very much and it was a real daunting technical challenge to figure out what was the structure of DNA. Any, any questions at this point? Okay, so let, let, let me move on here then. All right, so other people had been working on this problem. So as I said, Wilkins started this rather early, looking at chromosomes, and then he decided to start looking at DNA. Uh, there was one man in Norway who just worked at fi on fibrous proteins, and he knew that DNA was supposed to be this long, thin molecule. And he had done some nice work looking at what the sugar phosphate backbone was. He didn't know how the whole molecule would work together, where these bases were, but just by saying, if you, you got a sugar attached to a phosphate, to a sugar, to a phosphate, can I show what sort of structure that might have. And, and so there was a good model out there for the sugar phosphate backbone. One of the obstacles was having good DNA to work with. I mean, if DNA is a million base pairs long, this long, thin fragment, isn't it gonna break apart? And the answer is yes, it breaks apart real easily when you smash open the cells and you try and isolate it. Maurice Wilkins had fortunately gotten some excellent DNA from a Swiss biochemist. This Swiss biochemist worked on how you open the cells gently and then remove all the contaminants. And he felt DNA was really important enough that he made a lot of it and gave it to a few labs around the world saying, I'm good at making this stuff. You guys figure out what the structure is. So Wilkins had some of this good DNA. So Wilkins and, and his student, his name was Ryan Gosling, had done some early experiments trying to sort of slowly remove the water from DNA. And what they got was some not very good X-ray pictures, but they showed that the DNA molecules had somehow packed together in an orderly manner, and they were actually getting discrete spots. Now, he had reported this at a meeting earlier in Italy Watson had been at that meeting because he knew there was going to be a little information. And that is, in fact, what drove Watson to go to Cambridge, say, hey, DNA might be approachable. We might be able to do x-ray crystallography, and I need to learn how to do that. So off he went to Cambridge to work for Sir Lawrence Bragg in Perutz and the famous x-ray crystallographers there. So. And, and now we knew that the person Wilkins had given the good DNA to was Rosalind Franklin. And so she was down at King's College and she was getting some good pictures, better than the ones that Wilkins had got in his preliminary experiments. So what was happening with Wilkins down at King's College? It was kind of the key things, place where things were happening on determining the DNA structure. So she had a three-year fellowship. She arrived in January of 51. 
The first thing she did is she had some money to, to get a new x-ray camera and a sample holder. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at old pictures of this, the whole apparatus is you know about this big and the sample holder is about this big and they had a, you know some big batteries. Nowadays, if you do x-ray crystallography, they do it here up at UCSC, they have, we have a, a little local ones, much bigger, but when you do your real experiments, they go to the Stanford Linear Accelerator, which is two miles long to get an X-ray beam that is powerful enough and fine enough to, to blast into those proteins. So the technology has changed like a thousand X. But Rosalind had a good camera at the time, a chamber in which she could put her sample in a closed space and she could control the oxygen and the water and everything that was inside this chamber. So she had enough experience to know how to manipulate the salt, the humidity, and thus she could sort of slowly dry out the fiber and watch it as the chains packed together and started to form a somewhat crystalline array that then she could do x-rays. So after she was there about six months, she was showing Wilkins what she was doing and and Wilkins was actually complimenting and said, gee, Rosalind, that's really great. You used humidity and you varied the salt, you know, and, and that's really working. And Rosalind's reaction was, well, you should have known about this. You, you were really a poor chemist. And so they, they kind of didn't hit it off right from the beginning. She saw him just uh, not knowing how to do the project that he was maybe supposed to be supervising, and she was comparing her to her mentor back in Paris, Mering, whom she was probably also rather emotionally attached to. And so it was not a good start. So Wilkins and, and Rosalind Franklin had rather different personalities. And a part of it was that they came from very different social backgrounds. Uh, Wilkins was born in New Zealand, you know, he's from the colonies. He was a rather diffident kind of person. Rosalind was very much of the British upper class. She was rather the more aggressive in your face kind of person. And uh, she, in fact, in a, a letter to a friend, she complained to that Wilkins was among other things, just so middle class. <laughs> So she was unhappy coming back to England and she was unhappy with her work situation. So in fact, so in Brenda Maddox's biography, she has a sort of long quote on, on Rosalind's personality and, and how she was, she was dealing with Perkins. So this, this was somebody who was a friend of Rosalind and I'm just gonna read you a little part from Maddox's book. So she said that Rosalind's manner was brusque and at times confrontational. She aroused quite a lot of hostility among the people she talked to, and she seemed quite insensitive to this. But she was kindness itself to me, and I have fond memories of the time we spent together. I think she needed friends away from her workplace. A couple of months later, I was to leave for home, and she invited me to lunch to say goodbye and presented me with a little gift I was touched by this gesture, which showed a much softer side of the Franklin character. And this is generally true of her friends. The people who know her saw her as a very nice, warm person, but it wasn't the way she reacted to people she didn't know. Uh, also, <clears throat> they, they, she and Wilkins soon kind of had a, a clash when Rosalind started getting some very good data. Wilkins was interested in this and he suggested a collaboration. But you may remember last time I said that what Rosalind was told when she came was that this was her project and she wanted that independence. Another big factor in this, this clash between Wilkins and the Cambridge people and Rosalind Franklin is that she was a physical chemist and she did not like the idea of rushing into models. The idea of solving the structure by thinking up what might work. 
just did not fit her scientific approach. So she, she had gone to a, a science conference in which a, a very famous X-ray crystallographer named Bernal uh, had given a talk. And Bernal at the conference had stressed the importance of X-ray crystallography. And he said, what we need is we need to find the solution, not a solution, which the model building people are doing. And Rosalind had written this down in her notebook and it underlined the solution, not a solution. So she insisted on her independence and she started with the student Gosling who also became very much a, a fan and supporter of Rosalind of taking more photos, doing these long difficult uh, calculations. It should be said that these X-ray photos could take hours to do. So you got your sample in the chamber, you dried it to just the right point, you turned on the camera, you hope nothing went wrong for the next 10 hours. And she, she had golden hands, as we say in the lab. She could really do these experiments and make them work. So there was much argument over whether the DNA might form a helix. There were some suggestions of that in Wilkins' early uh, X-ray crystallography, but she felt it was too early to make conclusions that the data had some inconsistencies for that. But her notebook showed that she was actually leaning, she was leaning in the direction of a helical structure for DNA. So, as I said, Watson arrived in September and he was all enthusiastic about DNA structure. He knew from Crick that the place where the data was being obtained was King's College. And they knew through Wilkins that King's was gonna have a little local lecture series. The three people were gonna talk on what they were doing and Rosalind Franklin was going to be one of them. So uh, Jim Watson took the train, went down to London and went to listen to Rosalind's report on what she was doing. And there were about 15 people in the room. He didn't talk to her at all. I don't think she knew he was there, but it's interesting to, to hear what he had to say. And it, it shows uh, that now I'm turning to Watson's account of this. This is the dub, double helix, his first encounter with Rosalind Franklin. And it, it shows the two aspects of this. There was the science and then there was the personality. Remember the guy is 23 years old also. So, so what he said is that he, he arrived and said that Rosalind spoke to an audience of about 15 in a quick nervous style that suited the unornamented old lecture hall in which we were seated. There was not a trace of warmth or frivolity in her words. And yet I could not regard her as totally uninteresting. Momentarily, I wondered how she would look if she took off her glasses. It did something novel with her hair. Then, however, my main concern was her description of the crystalline X-ray diffraction pattern. So the point is that in Watson's book, the double helix. There go, continues to be a lot of this. Book, his book is largely half about, half about the DNA, half about looking for pretty girls, a fair amount of comments on, on the attractiveness of Rosalind Franklin. And it has somewhat tainted this story. And in the next lecture, not so much today, I'm gonna to focus more on the science. We're gonna to return to this, especially when we talk about the publication of this book the double helix. So anyway, what he saw is that Rosalind was getting really good pictures and, and, and she showed uh, some pictures that showed DNA was forming some sort of regular crystalline array. And he was much impressed with it. After the seminar, because he knew Crick and Crick knew Wilkins. He and Wilkins went out to dinner and Wilkins told him more of where they stood at King's. Wilkins told him about his clash with Rosalind Franklin and how this was becoming difficult for him. Should be said, Wilkins was also going through a difficult time in his marriage at this point, which may have come to play into it. 
So, so Watson found out a lot of what was happening and he especially he had seen the kind of the most recent data that Rosalind Franklin had. So the next morning, he and Francis Crick took a train ride to go to Oxford to talk to the crystallographers and people there about what, what was known about the structure of DNA and its component molecules. They, they were hot onto making a molecule, solving this the same way Pauling had done without doing any crystallography, but just doing it in their head. So Crick told, I mean, Watson told Crick what he'd heard at Rosalind's talk. Now he had not taken any notes, which Crick criticized him for, and he wasn't quite sure he remembered it all correctly, especially a key part of this was uh, as you dried out the crystal, how much water was left there. Water is an important part of the structure of these, these uh, biological molecules. Remember, 70% of our body is water, and that's those are molecules that are stuck to our proteins in the DNA. But from what Crick heard, he, like Watson, was convinced that the data were there to eliminate most of the possibilities and confine it just to a few possible structures. That would make building a model feasible if they could just get it down to the core components and then they could just make everything fit. So Crick did some rough calculations, thought, this is going to be work and said, we've really got to get going on this. And they, they felt at that time that with real concentrated effort, it would take them maybe a week. All right. Being young is really good sometimes. All right. So they had, uh, when they got back to Cambridge, they convinced their, their, their bosses, the senior professors, that they were gonna work on this. They wanted the Cambridge labs to make models of the sugar phosphate, the bases uh, to the precise shape and size that they knew these molecules should be. And then they could play with them and see if there were specific arrangements that had to be done to, to conduct, to uh, put together a 3D structure. All right, and they, they used a sugar phosphate backbone that had already been worked out. And within a few days, they had a model for DNA. Uh, and it was a helix model because that had been suggested to Watson and Crick from the pictures that Rosalind Franklin had shown. So this model had three helices in the backbone. So they took the sugar phosphate backbone and packed it all in the center of the molecule. And then they had the bases sticking out on the outside because then they didn't have to deal with them in their model. Uh, and they liked it well enough that they said, all right, we think we've got it here, but we need to talk to the people at King's because they have the, the, the X-ray data. So Crick convinced uh, then to come over, so uh, Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin agreed to take the train up to Cambridge to look at the model to see if they had solved the structure of DNA. So Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin arrived. They had the model set up in their office there. Crick talked a lot, told them all of the good things about the model. Rosalind was skeptical right from the beginning because they had put it in a helix and she thought the x-ray data was incomplete at best and maybe didn't fit. But mostly they had put all the sugar phosphates in the middle of the molecule. And she said, that is impossible. First of all, you don't have enough room to fit all the water molecules that are in this molecule. Watson had remembered incorrectly. He had told Crick the wrong data. You're off by a factor of 10. And he's, besides that, phosphate is a charged molecule. All those oxygens are minus and you're jamming them all together. That just won't work. This model is nonsense. And she was right. And they knew she was right. So really within an hour, Watson and Crick's one-week model for the structure of DNA was told to be all wrong. So this whole story got up to the head of the lab, Sir Lawrence Bragg, 
who wanted them to solve the structure. But at the same time, this sort of thing of solving other people's crosswords was just not done. And he kind of laid down the law. He said, look, we're working on proteins here at the Cavendish. The people down at King's, they have Rosalyn Franklin, they have Wilkins, they're working on this, leave them alone. I want you guys, Crick, I want you to finish your PhD. <laughs> and Watson, you come here to learn X-ray crystallography and help us with proteins. You're gonna work on that. King's College is gonna work on DNA. And so, so that is what happened. And that was late 1951 in the 1952. So Watson and Crick are still on the side or talking, they go out to lunch. They go out to lunch at the Eagle Pub, just around the corner, and they talk about DNA. And, and often Watson would, uh, he, he also, he complained a lot about the weather there. It is always cold. He complained about the food, he said the British food was terrible. So he, he would just conveniently drop in at the Cricks with Francis and Odalie Crick and she, having her French mother, was a very good cook, and he would eat there. And so they had to do other things. So, so what did Watson do with himself? Well, remember that his PhD had been working on these bacterial viruses, and, one, and he was very much involved in this bacterial phage group. So he decided to continue to work on a virus, but this, in this case, a plant virus, the tobacco mosaic virus. Now it wasn't so much because they were interested in this infection in tobacco, but because it was a good system, a good molecular system where you could get a lot of it, you could get it in a clean way. They knew lots of ways to test it and other people were working on this. They knew that viruses were made out of proteins and DNA, but they didn't have really, really good idea of how they, they all fit together. And so he started taking some X-ray photos. He was not a very good experimentalist. Neither was Crick. Neither of them were really good sitting down and doing the hard stuff in the lab. But he had some good equipment there. He got some good data. And he, he actually really made, in a way, some important contributions to understanding that. I'm just going to show you one slide here to show you what uh, Watson was doing during this time. OK. So uh, I don't want that one yet. OK, so this is it's called TMV, tobacco mosaic virus. And in an electron microscope, you can see the virus just barely. It's these long, thin rods. Uh, to see something in an electron microscope, you often have to coat it with a heavy metal. And it, kind of destroys the biological protein. So it allows you to get a picture, but you can't really work with it in any ways. These are so tiny that they cannot be seen in any, any light microscope. And Watson worked out that the structure was somewhat like what you see here, that each of these was a big protein, that is a polypeptide chain with hundreds of amino acids in it. And he did not work out the structure of the protein but he showed that the proteins themselves are, were arranged in this helix. So he could take bundles of viruses, shine x-rays through them, and from the way the uh, x-rays went through the protein versus the spaces in between the proteins, he worked out this structure. And there's also nucleic acid, ribonucleic acid in the center. Uh, he knew it was in the center someplace, but he didn't really know what, where it was. The important thing is that Watson, like Crick, developed a better sense of interpreting these X-ray photographs. Crick was very good at it. Crick was just intuitive. Somehow he could just look at these things and kind of visualize in his head. But Watson, you know, after he'd only been here less than a year, really kind of worked out the, the technology and the basic understanding of it so that he could understand them too. Okay, so uh, that's uh, kind of summer. Um, 
Watson continued to kind of think about the DNA idea. Another bit of information they had that he knew would be important was produced by a, a very prominent chemist uh, back in the States named Erwin Sh uh, Shargaff. And Shargaff had been isolating DNA from all kinds of creatures, from worms to bugs to plants to mammals, etc. And he found something odd about it. And that is that whatever the DNA he looked at, there were these four basic that you know the bases the a c t and g he found that in all dna the amount of a was always equivalent to the amount of t and the amount of c was always equivalent to the amount of g this is called shargaff's rules now some of them could be very rich in the gc's and have very little a t or it could be the other way around you know the total amount of a c g and t could vary tremendously from one organism to another, but A is always equal to T's and C is always work for G's. And Watson said, that's gotta be involved in the structure somehow, but he couldn't figure out how to, how to put that together. At one point, Shargaff came to, to the Cavendish on his way to a conference. And so Watson and Crick talked to him. And among other things, Shargaff asked Crick, what the structure of the nucleotide was. And Crick couldn't tell him. And Shargaff said, these, these are just two incompetent young people. They don't know what they're doing. He was very, very unhappy with them and never really dealt with them. Just thought they were, they were basically physicists or bird watchers playing around in fields they knew nothing about. All right. So, among other things, that summer, uh, Watson went to more conferences. They, they were very good about trying to find out what was going on around the world. He knew that Linus Pauling was going to be at this particular conference and he wanted to talk to Pauling. And he did get a chance to Pauling, but Pauling just saw him as a 24 year old, young, enthusiastic kid and they did a little chit chat. So that didn't go anywhere, but he got to sit next to Pauling's wife at lunch one day, and, you know, fellow Americans. And he found out that, that Pauling, that, that their son, Peter, was coming to Cavendish, the Cavendish lab to work with the same guys that Watson was working with. So Peter was gonna to come to Cavendish, all right. So into the summer, Watson is back working on his tobacco mosaic virus. Crick is desperately trying to finish his PhD and, and working on this small protein. They're now sharing an office with the Peter Pauling and another guy, another American who will come up later. And early one December, Peter Pauling walked in. You know, he's a graduate student there. And, uh, Watson describes him with a somewhat odd smile on his face. What's up, Peter? What's up, Peter? And he said, well, I got a letter from my dad. His dad is Linus Pauling. Dad says that he is a structure for DNA. Well, they're devastated. Here are their chances of being the discoverers or just right. If Linus Pauling had the structure, it was going to be the structure. So, well, well what, what, what does dad say? What does it look like? What does it look like? Well, he says he has a manuscript. He has a manuscript and it'll, it'll, we'll have to wait. And they had to wait a, a, a few weeks. Uh, but, but finally, uh, Peter walked in one morning and he had gotten a copy of the manuscript. His father had sent it to him. His father had also sent it to Sir Lawrence Bragg, the head of the Cavendish, said, here's my structure for, for DNA. And of course, they were competitors all this year. So in, in his book, Watson describes the, the scene of that morning. Okay, when Peter Pauling walks in with this, his father's manuscript and solving the structure of DNA. All right. He said, you know, he was being, Peter was being very coy about showing it to them. But Watson said, I pulled it out of Peter's outside coat pocket and began reading it immediately. I spent less than a minute with the summary and the introduction. And I was soon at the figures showing the location of the essential atoms. At once I felt something was not quite right. I could not pinpoint the mistake 
however, until I looked at the illustration for several minutes. Then I realized that the phosphate groups in Linus's model were not ionized, but each contained a bound hydrogen atom. Pauling's nucleic acid, DNA, was not in a sense an acid at all. So the world's greatest chemist had made a really fundamental mistake. DNA was an acid and his structure didn't allow it to be an acid. And the other people in the office and, and Bragg and all the others sort of looked it over and came to the same conclusion. This model, it just can't be right, it's wrong. And as so Crick said, they knew they were still in the game, as Crick put it. So Crick then talked to the sort of senior professors saying, you know, you're not letting us work on this, you know, and Pauling is gonna beat Cambridge once again. Uh, and Jim Watson and I are really eager to, to do it. We think we can build a model. We, wanted, we want you to let us go back and work on DNA. And they said, well, we would really like that, but we, we want the people at Kings to know it. And we were only gonna do it if, if they agree to it. All right, so let me just show you uh, uh, a little bit here. So that's Watson's TMV, okay. So here was Pauling's triple helix model. Now, so he's got the, the sugar phosphate backbone in the middle and these are the bases all sticking out on the side. And, and just diagrammatically, if you look at it from the top, here's the sugar phosphate backbone. And so the reason that when Watson and Crick looked at this model and said it was wrong, it's because it looked like their wrong model from months earlier. So Linus Pauling had really made the, the same kind of mistake they had in that they really didn't allow for all of the water molecules that had to bind those phosphates. And so, so it just wasn't gonna work. Okay. Now, this picture then comes into play this is Rosalind Franklin's famous photo 51. And this comes into the scene in the next part of our story here. So they've got Pauling's manuscript now. They're convinced it's wrong. Watson and Crick wanna work on it. The Cavendish professors are going to allow them to work on it, but they've got to talk to the people down at Kings, Wilkins and Franklin. So Jim Watson goes down to speak to the people at King's College. And he went looking for Wilkins. Wilkins was busy at the moment, said, oh, I'll go and I'll, I'll talk to Rosalind. I'll show her the manuscript. So he went to there and uh, let's see. And uh, let me tell you, uh, this is Jim Watson's uh, account of what this happened. And in terms of the controversy over this whole discovery, this day is the controversial day. Okay, so scene is that Rosalind Franklin is working on this. Frank, uh, Maurice Wilkins is working on this. He's now gonna show them that Pauling has proposed a model, but, it, but it's wrong. So um, I want to be at, all right. So he goes and he, he shows, shows her and he says he thought that uh, the fact that Pauling's model were no more inspired than Crick and my model might amuse her. The result was that Franklin became increasingly annoyed with my recurring references to helical structures she pointed out that there was not a shred of evidence that permitted Linus or anyone else to postulate a helical structure for DNA. Most of my words were to her superfluous for she knew that Pauling was wrong the moment I mentioned a helix. 
Now, then they started talking a little bit about Rosalind's own data. And at one point, uh, Jim Watson said, without further hesitation, I implied that she was competent. She was incompetent in interpreting x-ray pictures. <laughs> this is 24 year old Jim Watson telling this to Rosalind Franklin, who was one of the world's best x-ray crystallographers. If only she would learn some theory, she would understand how her supposed features arose from minor distortions, et cetera. And then he says, this is a, a kind of interesting part of the controversy here. Suddenly Rosie came from behind the lab bench that separated us and began moving towards me fearing that in her hot anger, she might strike me. I grabbed the falling manuscript and hastily retreated to the open door. My escape was blocked by Maurice, who searching for me had then just stuck his head through. While well, Maurice and Rosie looked at each other over my slouching figure, I lamely told Maurice that the conversation between Rosie and me was over. All right, now I should say that uh, this, this kind of account of how their interaction goes it was addressed in Brenda Maddox's book. So here's how Brenda Maddox sees this same scene. Okay. So she starts out with this quote from Watson's book saying, fearing that in her hot anger, she might strike me, end quote. The patent absurdity of this remark has caused much scorn. Rosalind was a slim build and medium height, Watson a stringy six feet plus, but the male fear of the female has always been absurd, the stronger af afraid of the weaker, but no less real for that. All right, to dismiss it is to dismiss the lowly lady, the wicked witch of the West and all the other guises for whatever the male resents and recoils from in the female. Anyway, uh, Maddox was not happy about the way Watson recounted the whole story. But the real controversy was the next step. So he's had this very strained conversation with Rosalind. Now he's found Maurice Wilkins. They go back to Wilkins' office and he says, Maurice, here's the Pauling manuscript. We think they're wrong. We want to work on this. And Wilkins' approach was that he would be, he was very open about what Kings was doing. He basically showed Watkins, uh, Watson kind of all of their data, including all of Rosalind Franklin's data. And it is there that Watkins saw this famous photo 51, which was a really good, clear, structured picture showing some real clues as to what form DNA might be in. And he told her, I mean, Wilkins told Watson, is what I want to say, that in fact, Rosalind had found this new form of DNA, one that was highly hydrated, long and thin, very ordered, the form that in, in fact, DNA forms in cells. And he showed the picture that she had taken of that form. So Watson's qu quote in the book, he said, the instant I saw the picture, my mouth fell open and my pulse began to race. Because he had developed the tuition enough to see just the dots on that picture that I showed you briefly. And you and I would look at that picture and it's a bunch of dots on a, on a slide, but it told him a lot about what the structure must be. So Watson goes back to the Cavendish. He went to see the head of the lab, Bragg, and he said, Kings is not gonna solve this structure anytime soon. Franklin is determined to not to do anything with it until she has the whole set of x-ray data. Wilkins is, is out of it. He doesn't have the good DNA. Also adding to the story is that at this point, Rosalind has told the, the leaders of Kings that she is leaving. She has found another position more suitable to her 
and she's going to leave in really just a couple of months. So she is leaving the DNA project. So um, what they had at this point, they, Watson and Crick, was kind of what was in Crick's memory from his conversation with Wilkins. They asked around a little bit and the senior professors there said, you know, we're all part of the Medical Research Council and we have to do an annual report. Kings did a report very recently and we have that report. It's not a confidential report, but it has in here a summary of what Rosa and Franklin's been doing. And so they showed that to Watson and Crick and that was another key set of data too. Now, now often if you've, you've read this story, uh, and I was confused by this too, that that's where they saw this famous photo. That turns out to be wrong. Uh, there were no photos in Rosalind's report. There were just 11 paragraphs, but there was a table that gave some data on the crystals. And one line in that said that this new type of DNA that she had been getting good photographs from formed a crystal of the type called, quote, monoclinic C2. And Crick just saw that and having this tuition said, I know what that means. That means that it's a crystal that if you take a picture of it right side up and upside down, it looks identical. It's perfectly symmetrical this way and upside down. And so if you have helices, the only way that will work is if one of them goes in this direction and the other one goes in the opposite direction. So when you turn it around, there's still one up and one down. It'll give you the same picture. And that was, that was a key intuition into, into getting to the double helix structure. So they got this summary of the data and it's always been controversial as to whether they should have had that. In a way, it was public data. The real controversy is, should Rosalind Franklin have known, been told that they had the data that she had put in that report? Okay, so Watson was intently working on the model in the office because they, they thought they had all of the parts. They knew the backbone, the sugar phosphate backbone. Watson said, it could be two or three helices that would be consistent with the x-ray data. He says, it's going to be two because nature loves pairs. Nature likes to work in two. Crick said, that's crazy, but says, no, Watson said, it's going, to, it's going to be two helices. And Crick says, they're going to run in opposite directions. So they had all their models. And Watson is in, in, intensely working on the models. He knows Shargaff's rules, uh, and among other things, but he didn't know what would hold the helices together. And he worked and worked on the models and they just, they just wouldn't line up. And here, I'm gonna go back here and show you some pictures that explain how he was approaching this. So here was Rosalind Franklin's famous photo 52. And the fact that it forms this cross strongly suggested that it was a helix the spacing here suggests the spacing between the bases and the cross. And they could work out the angle and the tilt, everything just from the kind of intensity uh, and the spacing in this picture. Okay. Um, and, Helix, and Watson for a while came up with this type of model where he said, well, let's have every A bind with an A and every C with a C. This is a like with a like model. But there were just lots of things wrong with this. For one thing, the, the helices were going in the same direction and that couldn't be true. Crick says, no, they've got to go in opposite direction. Plus some of, some of these were long, GG might be very big, AA might be very small. Uh, and so it just didn't fit. It didn't fit. So while he's struggling with this in the office where all these guys have their desks, there's an, we have this amazing bit of serendipity, which plays such an important role in science. 
There was another student, former student of Linus Pauling in the office, an American named Jerry Donahue. And he was a real X-ray crystallography expert, especially of mole molecules. And he saw Watson playing with these models. He said, you know, I think your models are wrong. You've got the wrong model for the basis. So here, here is the A, T, C, and G. Okay. And Jerry Donahue said, you know, these can exist in two forms, either the enol form or the keto form. I just said, this is A, C, T, and G. That's wrong. This is just T and G. All right. But if we look at T over here, this oxygen can have a hydrogen on it. Or alternatively, the hydrogen can be on the nitrogen. So this is called the enol form. And this is the keto form. And Watson, no, no, I'm sure, I'm sure this is right. I looked it up. I looked it up in the textbooks. And Donahue said, yeah, the books are wrong. The books are wrong. I'm a chemist. They're wrong. Ask other chemists, which he did. And he found out that the other chemists said, yeah, they're wrong. They're really not in this form. The hydrogen isn't up there. It's down in the nitrogen. It's in this form. And this is the same thing for the guanine. The hydrogen wasn't here. It was down on the nitrogen, like here. Now, what this meant is just picture that you've got a cardboard cutout. And in this molecule, you've got a big bump here and a hole here. In this molecule, you've got a larger bump here and a, a smaller one here. They're just going to be fundamentally different shapes. And after just a little bit of what he had to do is he didn't, they had these fancy metal models of all the bases, but Watson couldn't wait to get new ones. He cut them out of cardboard and started playing with them and very quickly stumbled on this fact that you got this perfect alignment if you paired an A with a T and it could form two bonds, two hydrogen bonds of just the right length. And if you formed a, a G with a C, it also formed bonds of just the right length. And furthermore, it was striking that the AT pair had very much the same shape and almost the exact linear dimensions as the GC pair. Well, this explains Shargaff's rules. Why was there always equal amounts of A and T? Because A and T form pairs. And G and C were your equal amounts because G and C form pairs. So this was kind of the last key thing that just fell into place. So they started working madly on, on putting the whole rest of the molecule together. And they found that, that they could make everything fit beautifully. Crick came in, saw that other details in the models really worked just perfectly. Here is their actual model. This is, this is quite big. This thing is about six feet tall. All right. And so here you have the sugar phosphate backbone. And then you're looking end on at the bases, like a G and a C here so that the inside was the pairing of these GC base pairs. And everything fits so precisely that they really thought they had it. So for lunch, they went next door to the Eagle Pub and Crick announced to everyone that they had found the secret of life. And if you're a biologist, <clears throat> there, there are certain places you have to take a pilgrimage to. You have to take a pilgrimage to the Galapagos and you really should take a pilgrimage to Darwin's house, which is fun to see. But the third place is you have to go to the Eagle Pub and have, have a beer, because this is where they announced that they had found the secret to life. And there's, a, there's a plaque here, among other things. A lot of this is about World War II, but there's a little line in here. It's also the place where Watson and Crick announced that they had found the structure of DNA at the Eagle Pub. <clears throat> okay. So what happened with this model? Of course, they got all the crystallographers there at Cambridge to come and look at it, including Bragg. 
you know, the head of the whole lab. <clears throat> and he looked at it and he, he just loved it immediately. It just fit. And they called the people at King's. They called Maurice Wilkins and Wilkins agreed to come and Rosalind Franklin agreed to come also. Although she had just moved from King's to Birkbeck College. And so she came a couple of weeks later. Uh, and Watson describes Rosalind coming to look at the model and he was standing there saying, oh, I just know she's gonna find something wrong with this. I just hope we got it right. And she looked at it for a very short period of time and says, you know, it just, it explains everything. The data just fits it perfectly. And so they, they really had it. As they said, it was just too pretty to be wrong. Uh, Crick went over it, you know, inch by inch to get all, make sure that all the bond angles and the stereo distances were correct. And it just, it, it just looked right. So what to do, how to, how, to, how to publish the paper, et cetera. So there was an agreement that, you know, certainly the King's data, they should have the opportunity to publish what they had <clears throat> at the same time Watson and Crick did. And so the, the initial agreement was, all right, there would be one paper <clears throat> from the Cavendish people, Watson Crick, <clears throat> there would be another paper from King's. <clears throat> The discussion at King's said, no, that the Wilkins data and Rosalind's data were gonna be in separate publications. Rosalind wanted to publish her own data. And so in fact, there were three people that were uh, three different papers that were published. So Bragg of course had connections with Nature. Nature is kind of the big journal. And uh, Watson describes his sister Elizabeth coming in and actually being the typist on the weekend, typing up the final version of the paper. It was submitted on the 1st of April in 1953 and, and appeared in print really just a, a few weeks later. So let me show you this, this famous paper. This famous paper was barely one page long. Here it is, April 25th, 1953, in Nature, the Molecular Structure of Nucleic Acids, a structure for deoxyribal nucleic acid. And they, they explain the, the kind of structure. They give the famous double helix with the backbone on the inside and the bases uh, on the outside and the bases on the inside. In this famous sentence, the last sentence in the, in the regular text of the paper right here, it has not escaped our notice. Oh, oh whoops, I got out uh, here. So this sentence, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. And this is what was so beautiful about the model that you could see that if you pulled the two strands apart, and they were held together by very weak bonds, so that that was very feasible biochemically. Then each one was a template uh, for replicating the entire molecule. It really explained how you could use a molecule to faithfully transmit information for generation after generation. They they had to deal with somehow saying that they'd gotten this information partly from x-ray data that was not theirs. <laughs> and so they put that in, in the bottom paragraph here. So it said, we are much indebted to Dr. Jerry Donahue. This is the guy who said, these are uh, keto forms, not enol, uh, for constant advice and criticism, especially on interatomic distances. We have also been stimulated by a knowledge of the general nature of the unpublished experimental results and ideas of Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Franklin and their coworkers at King's College. All right, so this is the way they, they dealt with the, with the unpublished results. And in, and in the next year or so, they, they published three more papers that gave a lot of long detailed analysis of the structure. Okay, so 
the Watson Crick model sort of was indeed uh, too pretty to be wrong. Here they are celebrating. And uh, soon uh, the newspapers picked it up. This is, was a posed picture. This is the famous picture of Watson and Crick showing their model. And the photographer asked Crick if he could use a slide rule to point at a particular part. But they posed this for the, for the uh, newspapers. Anyway, further x-ray crystallography was done and it led to only minor tweaks. It was accepted fairly quickly. There were a few holdouts for years that no, they still think the proteins had to have a key part. The new big questions were, were how to read the code and, and how to get from DNA to protein. Uh, there's some ideas that maybe DNA served as like a giant super enzyme. They, they had no idea of what the next steps were. So Watson and Crick both got involved in that. Rosalind had moved to Birkbeck in March. And uh, this person, this is Rosalind here, and this is a person, a good supportive colleague, Aaron Klug, we'll talk about next time. This is Crick here, and this is Crick's wife, Odalie. This is John Kendrew here. So, so what happened to them? What happened to them in the rest of their lives? What was the effect on them of the discovery of the double helix? And so what we're going to address next time is, will Francis Crick finish his PhD and go on to do anything important? Will Rosalind find a happy supportive lab after an unhappy time at King's? Will Jim Watson ever grow up? <laughs> so we will address all of these questions in our, in our fourth and final lecture uh, in next time. So questions, anybody have questions? That was really great, Barry. But how come you how come you titled your talk "The Men Who Discovered This"? Why did you do that? I sent an email to Dennis saying, "Dennis, you are going to get me in trouble. You did not read my title. If, in other words, it wasn't my fault." <laughs> <laughs> I know. As soon as I saw that, you know, they said they sent to me a notice that this is going out to Oli, and I thought, "No, no." <laughs> so. Somebody hey, made it happen, but it wasn't me. Okay. <laughs> yes, Garrett. Uh, I noticed the uh, CG connection or, or two bonds, but isn't that really three? And when did that, when was that discovered? You are you are absolutely right about that. So that was one little mistake in the model. Uh, they thought they were a little bit farther apart. Just basically further tweaking of the of the X-ray crystallography data showed that the, those the spacing there was was close enough that there is a third. Uh, bond there. And it's an important part in the DNA. It says that if, you're, if you've are if you got a lot of Gs and Cs, the D DNA is held more tightly together than if you've got a lot of As and Ts. Uh, other questions, comments? Harriet, and then go it's, to- It's not a question, um, but uh, it's about the personality of Rosalind mm -hmm. uh, Franklin. Um, I read that she did not want to leave France. She was very unhappy because she loved it there, especially mm -hmm. because of the great food and the wonderful clothes, for both of which she had a passion for. And, and they, they treated her much more as an equal there. And the lab was not stuffy the way a lot of the British labs were. So, I mean, all of, all the, all of those things uh, affected her. But, you know, I think, I, I think the key difference here and the question of whether Rosalind was properly acknowledged, whether she should have been involved, it is just a different scientific approach. She had a very legitimate approach to saying, I want to get all the data before I start speculating about what the structure might be. And you know, that just didn't work out in this, in this case. All right, other questions, comments? Oh, Gunter. Oh, you're muted.
First, let me say thank you. I was really re-inspired by chemistry. You know, <laughs> when I, in high school, uh, I I had a bad professor, I guess. You know, and I I, I passed. I had other good grades, and, and I de-emphasized chemistry. But thank you so much. My question is on DNA. You said it's A, C, G, and T, but I also saw a U. So what is what is a U there? It's the difference between DNA and RNA. So, oh, okay. it, so it's just that RNA does not use the T. It uses a structurally very similar molecule, the U. But that only goes up in, in RNA. Yeah. And every once in a while, in, at one, I was fishing out a, a picture for nucleic acid structure, and I hadn't noticed that it was RNA instead of DNA. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, and then I, I, I hope you will, will come for the last one because there's actually lots of interesting things to hear about that these people led very interesting lives and went, went in very, very different directions to some extent. Uh, and uh, so, so we will finish this.